Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Howard Abrams. Um, as I might have mentioned earlier, I lead the PDX Emacs Hackers Group, and um, and it'd be great if uh, I could keep attending yours, because this looks like a lot of fun. Um, I'd love to have you guys speak at mine, um, but I think the time change might be a little bit uh, uh, obnoxious for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I thought I'd talk a, a little bit about eShell. I actually uh, sent a, a little Twitter over to Captain John to kind of check out why he uh, wrote eShell. Um, he mentioned that uh, he wanted a, uh, you know, a Linux-like interface to Windows. Uh, I think he was on a Windows machine or something at the time, and it's since been integrated into Emacs. And I, you know, I started off with, uh, I think it was K-Shell, I don't know, it's been so many years, uh, but I've used a lot of shells over the years. And when I tried uh, E-Shell out at first, um, I don't know, I shelved it, because I didn't think it was shell enough. It was uh, just a little confusing, or I didn't understand it well enough. Um, but then I rediscovered it just a few years ago, and uh, I think this time I got it. So it seemed like a lot more um, interesting to me, and a lot more useful. So tonight, what I thought I would uh, kind of cover is uh, start at the top. Assume you don't know anything about eShell and just walk through what it really is, but I'm going to do it kind of uh, detailed-like, so we'll, we'll uh, want to explore every little nook and cranny, because uh, I think that's the, what the trick in order to really understand and how to use it effectively. And then at the end, um, since this is a hackers group, uh, I'm going to give you some ideas on how you might want to uh, hack and extend and change it. Now some of this stuff, uh, I've given this presentation to my own group um, last week, and many of them thought it was pretty complicated at times, uh, so don't worry about that. Since I'm recording this, um, I've also will put up a transcript with all of the, um, the links and, you know, and all the little technical stuff that I type in. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's just jump into some things. So, let's talk just about the shell, and when I say the shell, um, I think you know what I mean. We're talking about the Unix shell. I mean, it's a very powerful thing. Um, I mean, pipes and the redirection and all that kind of stuff is just kind of something we use all the time, and we just love it because we can use all these little small executables and pipe them all together. But of course, we have to use all these little tiny executables because the shell is, well, let's just say it's, uh, it doesn't have a lot of power in and of itself. The power comes from what it calls. Um, obviously, uh, the history is great. Uh, you have to have it because I don't know about you, but I never type in the right thing at first. <laughs> you know, and so you have to kind of keep typing it in multiple times until you get it right. Uh, the shell has some bad parts. I mean, you could kind of think of if you're just trying to run a program, well, it's let's pretend it's a key sequence, uh, but you definitely have to have, you know, code completion just because some of this stuff can get a little long and, ha and hairy. Uh, loops are pretty cool. Uh, again, you got to have history because you'll never do it right the first time. Uh, but of course, when you're dealing with a terminal, which is how most of us are using the shell, yeah, really, you got to copy and paste with a mouse. Um, yeah. Uh, but then there's some downsides. I mean, the shell is is great and extensible, and you can you know you can just really change it. But boy, what an awful language! I mean, really, this uh, it really could use some improvements. A lot to, a lot has been improved over the years, but still, it doesn't cut it compared to other languages. Uh, but you know, you think about it, we really know the shell. And I think that's where eShell comes into uh, into its own, is because we know the shell, we know how to use it, and therefore we can get some use out of it. Um, let me just diverge just a little bit and uh, talk about IPython. I don't know if any of you have seen this thing, but it's it's kind of a, a, it's a REPL, basically. But it's got some cool features in that it kind of acts like a shell itself. I mean. I can do things like uh, typical Python commands. By the way, that's the best part of Python right there, you see. Uh, but I can also do some shell-like things, like it knows about directories, and I can do an ls, and I can even uh, look at some files. I mean, the main goal of it, uh, you know, well, 
course, as you can see here, it doesn't know everything about the shell because it doesn't run all the shell executables. I mean, it's designed to run Python code. Uh, and if you want to run something else like a Ruby script, you got to basically call system. So, you know, here's an interesting thing about it. Uh, here I've got the cat, uh, you know, we all used to this, but it's not actually spawning cat. Um, if you type in a percent and hit tab, you can kind of see all of the different functions that they've rewritten in IPython in order to simulate a, a shell. Which means I can like uh, define a new function um, that overwrites one of these things. And of course I can see that yeah, it is a function and I can call it, but now it's overshadowed the old one and so I can't call its old function. Anyway, I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, attempt at trying to blend a REPL and a shell. Let me just exit out of this. All right, let's talk about eShell itself. And let's talk about it in two aspects here. Let's talk about it as a REPL and well as a shell-like, I'm going to call it a program worker. I mean, as a shell, um, here I'm just going to start it up here. It's got the same kind of concept of a directory. Um, I can do ls, I can cat files, I can do all the same things that you would expect in a shell. I can run programs though, but in this case I'm actually running the programs directly. Uh, it has glob expressions, so I can run a Python, all the Python programs in here at one time, which is just this one. Um, one thing I think is interesting is like a shell, I can um, put words around. It, it doesn't understand the uh, difference between different quotes, between double and single. But like a shell, everything is a string except for the first command. So I actually don't have to put strings or quotes around this to make it a string. Um, also like a shell, it understands aliases. So here I can create an alias, but notice something interesting. I'm not calling a program here. I'm actually calling uh, an Emacs Lisp function. And this is just exactly what you'd expect. I can run it and it opens up a program in another window. And I think you kind of start to see where this becomes uh, pretty powerful in that you can call executables, but you could also call functions. Uh, the history part, you know, like um, Metapede, you know, to scroll back up through. Um, Meta R is one of my favorites because I can see all the history of things that I've typed. Um, you could even jump back and forth between each one of these things. Um, you know, I don't know. It, it seems like as a history thing, it beats the terminal. Plus, you don't have to uh, use a mouse in order to highlight copy and pasting and things like that. Now, as a REPL, though, it's, it's a lot like a, a, a typical scratch buffer, where I can type any kind of Emacs Lisp expression, and it works just the way you would think it was. Now, there's actually two different, and I'm having a hard time with the wording here. I originally think it, you might think of it like two different modes, but it's really more like two different syntax parsers. There's the shell expressions and the Lisp expressions. And as you can tell, as soon as I type in parentheses, it's going into the Lisp parser. Uh, but if I remove the parentheses, it now types it into the shell parser. And as you can tell, sometimes these things look exactly the same, or, or at least behave the same. Um, and, you know, since we are in the shell um, parsing here, uh, I don't have to actually use quotes around this. Now, if I put parentheses around it, that would be an Isha, or that would be a Lisp uh, parser, and then I would have to, because it'd be being into Lisp. Now, I can uh, do something like this. Uh, this is typical Lisp, but I can leave the parentheses out, and it converts these strings into numbers. And that's something that eShell just does automatically. It notices that they're numbers, converts them over, and then it calls into uh, the function that I've called. 
And you can mix these two so I can um, put them both together. And so I can go back and forth between this shell parser and this list parser. All right, let me take a look at some files here. Uh, the glob expression here basically turns this uh, a, a series of files into a list itself. So I can do length on it. And I can even do, uh, OK, let's. there's only one thing here. Let me create another file. All right, now if I do it, um, you can see that there are two files here. And if I echo them, you can see that it's actually returning a list itself that you can deal with. So to, let me just go a little deeper into these two different parsers here uh, and when you can call the two. So I'm going to create a function or a, a variable here. Now this is a tip, this is just a standard Emacs variable. I just called it answer. Uh, and since I didn't have it in parentheses, uh, it's in the shell parser mode, but of course it converted that 42 into a number. So I can even type number p and uh, see that it actually did convert it into a number. Um, while I'm at it, let me just create another variable here that's a string. Yes, it's a string, all right. Uh, and now I can call something like this, but of course it's going to barf. Uh, and the reason for this, obviously, is we've seen just above here, uh, each one of these, this variable the answer is a string, and we need it as the variable, so we need to put a dollar sign in front of it. The dollar answer then gets converted uh, or gets replaced with a number, and then the mod function works. Mod is modulus, right? You know, taking the remainder. Now, if I put it in parentheses, obviously, I don't need to have that dollar sign. The dollar uh, symbol is only for the list parser or the shell parser. Man, I'm going to get confused, I suppose. Uh, so, obviously, the dollar thing doesn't work within a lisp. All right, now, if you put the two together, they work just the same as what you would expect in a typical shell. But if you wanted to replace one of these variables with an expression, like something like this, it's not going to work because it's interpreting it a little differently. And in this case, this is where the dollar parent works. So here I can type this whole thing in, but put dollar parent in, and it works the way you would expect it. Let's try a different one. This time I'm going to use dollar curly brace. Curly brace, curly bracket, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you guys say on that side of the pond, but, uh, but when you have a dollar curly brace, now you're going into shell mode. And so the shell parser mode is going to interpret it at that point. All right, where you'd use these two the most is in a loop. Um, the typical do loop doesn't work, um, as you'd kind of expect. It's, I don't know if any of, I didn't see a lot of uh, gray beards around the room, um, but there was this one shell called C shell, and it, it kind of looks a little bit like that. Essentially, you take the second uh, action that you want, and you put it into curlies, and that gets executed. So here, there's, there's essentially three parts to it. There's, a four, uh, there's the variable part, the list, uh, and then the action. Now, this list, you can do it basically with any way you want to generate that list. Um, I could use a Lisp expression. So here, I'm just going to call number sequence. I'll generate five numbers. And then I can call um, the action on each one of those things. Um, by the way, this percent sign is a uh, alias for the modulus. Now, I can generate this lisp, uh, the list, any way I want. So here, I've done it with the E shell mode, uh, and it acts the same way. Now, you can't replace the action with a lisp, lisp parser mode. I don't think it seems to work. I couldn't figure out exactly how to do that. But if you put it inside a shell mode, then you can run Lisp as the action. Um, but I'm not sure if that's really that helpful. Uh, let's talk about um, that thing I showed in IPython where I overshadowed the cat function. Uh, I mean, think about uh, a typical environment like with find. There's an executable 
um, that you can do a man page on here. Uh, but there's also that find function, and which one is it going to call? eShell has a order based on whether it's calling a list function or an executable, and I can demonstrate that pretty easily. I created this little executable called foobar, and doing a witch on it tells me that's where it is, and running it, it works. Now, if I create a regular function here, now this is just a typical Emacs function. Notice it doesn't even have the word uh, or the execute or the interactive mode in there. Uh, now, when I do a which, it's going to say, hey, foobar is going to call this Lisp function. And it does. Now, if I do eshell, uh, eshell slash as a prefix, that overshadows the previous function. And this is so uh, you can create that uh, you can create your functions that you're going to use only in eShell. It seems like a, a pretty useful feature, which shows the right thing, and running it works well. Now, overshadowing all of these is an alias, so which is going to show me that it's going to be an alias, and it works this way. So you can kind of see how this precedence order uh, works. Now, of course. Uh, of course, everything is in, everything in Emacs is customizable, and there's a couple of um, settings that you can set to true in order to reverse this behavior. One of the nice features about eShell is, uh, I don't know, predicate filters, I call them glob and filters. It's something they, um, I think Captain John stole from, um, uh, from ZShell. By the way, I call him Captain John because he's leading the Emacs ship, <laughs> not, not because I think he's a sailor. Um, but let's uh, let me look at these files here. And the way a glob and filter works is you basically put parentheses at the end of a glob expression, and you can specify something. So here I've specified to list only the files in this directory. Uh, you can put a uh, caret symbol in order to reverse it. So here I'm basically doing the same thing. I'm saying print everything that's not a directory, which case uh, it could show sockets or pipes or special files like that. Now there's a whole mess ton of uh, different options, and you can type this little expression here to kind of get a uh, overview of all of the different um, codes that you can put in there. Um, but what I've noticed here, oops, what I've noticed is that uh, this list is is pretty much all you really need, or at least it seems to me. Some of the more interesting ones, though, is uh, like the capital L, which uh, limits things based on size. So here I'm, I'm listing all of the files uh, that happen to have 50 characters or more. And as you notice here, I've got, um, I'm, I'm kind of combining these filters. Let me create a few files here. Um, obviously, using touch means they're going to be empty. So if I was to do a capital L but with less than one, meaning <laughs> no contents at all, I'm going to get all these files that I've created with touch. All right, now the M is for modification time. So here I'm just listing all the ones that I've created within the last 40 seconds. Now the M, though, can also work with a file. So here the I'm, I'm listing all the files that I've created since I created this one file called Goopy. I could do a plus and say, hey, show me all the files I've created before I created Goopy. Now, this I think is kind of a cool feature, and I discovered it accidentally. Um, I've got this directory of my journal entries, and I have a different one for every uh, day. And I'm just going to uh, use the filter to say, grab all of the files that happen to have uh, 5,000 bytes in them or more, and pass them to Dart. And now I've got all the things I would expect I could do. Um, in a typical dired mode. Hold on a second, what's going on here? 
All right. Um, so let's uh, let's move on to modifiers. This is something that's kind of similar. Um, it basically changes the uh, behavior of, or the output from a string or a list. So I can type in a string and I put um, parentheses with a colon and that says, hey, grab one of these modifiers and the capital U modifier uppercases it. Now, if you give a list, which I can get with just a glob expression, then it'll uppercase all of the contents in that list. And in this case, I'm just giving it all the files. This is where we typically use it. And of course, we can combine these things, and they have a lot of different options. Um, again, um, not all of these are that useful, but being able to uh, throw these into a regular expression to kind of convert things, I think, is kind of helpful at times. Um, let's combine this one. So here I've uh, taken uh, all of the files that happen to be empty, and I've uppercased them. Uh, where you'd really use them is in a for loop, because you wouldn't probably combine a filter with one of these modifiers, but you'd split them up in a loop. So here what I've done is I've taken all of those empty files, and I've passed them into a move operation where I've uppercased them. And so if I do ls, all the empty files are now uppercase. Um, now you could, there's uh, an option for reversing, colon r, um, but like writing a, a list like this, it doesn't seem to work because, you know, the double parentheses here is confusing the parser. So in this case, if you assign it to a variable, uh, then it works the way you think it would. But I suppose at this point, we'd probably just write a list pr uh, command to do the same sort of thing. So, you know, if you don't remember all of those predicates or modifiers, you can always just uh, use lisp. All right, so that's my overview of eShell itself. Um, let's talk about some hack points. Um, these are just things that I've done and, and used over the years to kind of change it uh, and extend it the way I like it. Uh, probably the most obvious thing is just to write your own functions. I mean, this is how we use uh, the shell in general is, you know, we'll write functions or write executables or write scripts to kind of help it out. Typically, what you want to do is uh, use a uh, eShell with a prefix and an interactive, uh, or it doesn't have to be interactive, but uh, you might want to take uh, and use REST, uh, the REST argument, um, kind of act more like a shell function, and then if you do, you can just uh, call pop to get the first thing on the list. Um, like with this function here, if I type in do work, it's just going to use my directory here, but I can call it with uh, another directory and it'll use um, use it from there. So now, you know, if you know enough about Lisp, it's pretty straightforward to do this sort of thing. Um, one feature that I like about eShell is that if you set the default directory to a tramp reference, it recognizes it. So you can actually start eShell uh, working with a remote computer. Um, I have a lot of different systems that I have to work with, and um, so I like to have a basically an easier way of accessing all of my machines, because they all have you know, usually weird words, and I certainly can't remember the IP address. Um, this is I've kind of simplified it a little bit, but I, I typically create a hash table that's just going to have all of these things, and then I can go through and just add um, the host name and then the IP address to this list. Now, I also uh, use um, uh, OpenStack with some hypervisors, and uh, I can connect to the controller from Emacs, I can issue commands through its REST interface to get a list of all of my virtual machines, and I can actually populate my hash table with those machines. Now, once I've got them all in here, I can create if um, I create this little function I call favorite, and it takes a, a host name as a parameter, but I use IDO completing read in order to kind of give me a list of all of those hosts. 
uh, I also do something and then I can pull it back out. I also have uh, a thing where I can kind of do a control U first before I call it so it'll use a root and I just pass it. I just changed the tramp reference here as you can see to use sudo. Now you can see the ex uh, I've got a screenshot here on the left of how this looks if I just type in the word control. It just gives me a list of all the control or all the uh, host names that match that. I, don't know, I think that's kind of sweet if you're um, willing to work with tramp. Ah, uh, you know, it, sorry about that. Yes, it was small. Uh, tell you what, I will just uh, send you out uh, uh, all this code. So uh, another uh, hack point uh, that I think is kind of cool is um, the predicates that uh, the D shell has, you can make your own. Now the capital U uh, predicate filter that I was uh, I was showing, or um, the capital U will uh, check to see if a file is owned by a uh, by the current user by yourself, right? So, um, so let's open up my E shell here. Um, let's change the ownership of one of my files here. All right, and so now I can say, hey, show me all the files that I own and all the ones I don't own. Uh, and it could be written this way, where um, you just check to see if the file exists, I get the file attributes on them, and then we can compare them with the user ID. Once you have this kind of a function, then all you need to do is just hook this function up into this uh, eShell predicate A list and uh, hook it up with a particular letter. Now, uh, this is pretty straightforward uh, in order to kind of add your own functions if you wanted to. So I decided to do that. Um, I have um, my engineering notebook contains quite a few files. They're on various subjects. Um, well, here, I'll pull one up. This is probably a little small to read here. Not that it matters. The key thing is, though, it's it's in org mode, and I use uh, org mode's tag things. And this is just text. It's inside the file. But what I wanted to do is have a predicate that could read some of these tags. Um, and so that's exactly what I wrote. So now I can say capital T, excuse me, give me one of these uh, tags and it'll pull up all the files that happen to have those, one of those tags in that tags line inside the file. Um, finally, I, I got another idea here. Uh, eShell is not so good when it comes to piping things. Uh, the typical Unix shell pipes with um, you know, with direct sockets between executables. And so they're pretty fast and pretty efficient. Uh, with eShell, this stuff is being pulled into Emacs buffers. Now, of course, uh, with, the, uh, with the shell, you kind of have to because it doesn't really deal very well with, um, with text. Whereas with Emacs, it kind of does. So maybe there's, uh, we could, if we think differently, maybe we don't care so much about the fact that uh, the D shell doesn't work that well with pipes. Let me show you what I mean. So I can take, a, I can do an echo here and I can write it into a buffer and I'm just calling this buffer fling. Let me pull it up here. So here's the fling buffer um, and anything that I redirect into this buffer here just updates that buffer. Now Okay, so I've got a list of my files in this buffer. Well, I can do things like, um, I don't know, like keep lines, and I can keep all of the files that end in .py. Um, I can call flush lines here uh, and get rid of everything that has the word go. 
Okay, so now I've kind of uh, selected all of the files that I care about. I mean, I could select them all, and I could maybe pipe them out to a shell expression or something like that. Um, however, I thought I'd create a function called args. It's kind of like xargs, where it takes all the files out of a buffer and pipes them to another command, like echo here. Uh, where I was thinking I might want to use this most is by um, doing something like a move or something. So in this case, let me make a directory oddities here, and I'm just going to move each of these files over. And I'm using this percent character as a, um, a substitution marker, so it'll put all the files there um, that it gets from this bargs function. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's some ideas here uh, that are still lurking in eShell that I think we can kind of expand on. Um, here's the code that I've written for it. Like I say, I'll send you all the code so that you don't have to try to uh, memorize or look at this stuff. So, in summary, um, while I think eShell can be helpful in if you happen to use multiple operating systems, I do think that there's something special about it. I mean, it's definitely more hackable and therefore more funner and something uh, that I think we could really use. The pipes uh, is something that people complain about, but I think if you use Emacs buffers the way, um, the way they're intended, I think it's not so much of an issue. Uh, often the other command, uh, pro, uh, complaint that I hear is that when uh, someone types in like top, uh, Emacs goes crazy because it can't render it. There's an answer here. You just add it to this eShell visual commands. It's just a list, so any command that uh, you want, you put it in this list, and if you type it into eShell, it just spawns up a term buffer, and uh, it works just fine. Uh, he's even expanded it so that uh, you, it'll call it only if certain programs like git here get certain options or s certain subcommands. Um, Again, a, a lot depends on how you're using it this way. Um, but yeah, my goal was kind of just kind of to inspire some ideas um, and what you might want to think about how you would expend them. I don't know if I could hear any questions, but I'll take them. Uh, could you repeat each question? I can't quite hear them. Do you still use Method X shell? Uh, you know, not very often. Uh, sometimes I do when I am uh, needing to uh, SSH into a system uh, where I uh, have Tmux running with uh, long running processes. Uh, and in that case, um, I, I don't get the right terminal interface that's correct, so I sometimes do do uh, I sometimes do use uh, Meta X shell, but most of the time um, I'm just kicking off uh, E shell to get most of my work done. Yeah, very, very good, very good question. Um, there's a couple of ways. I mean, you can set the environment, you can set the path environment variable in Emacs to be anything that you want, in case you want it different. If you want it the same, um, I actually have in my dot uh, dot files uh, a function that goes through and uh, calls bash, gets the path from it and parses it out so in case I changed anything. I don't actually use it that much because um, I, I, like I used to, uh, since I'm now pretty much all in Emacs, I just kind of set it up directly that way.
I did. I, I did. In fact, I think I still have it that way. But like I say, um, uh, I, I've since been just kind of hacking on the path environment variable uh, directly in Emacs. I think that's probably an easier approach. Uh, no, not really. I mean, um, I mean, Emacs 26 is going to have some sort of uh, minimal threading, but Emacs really doesn't have that sort of stuff. So yeah, you kind of have to um, be uh, cognizant of that and uh, run long running sh uh, processes in the background and things like that. I think um, I think once you understand how uh, this e shell works, you can start to uh, play with it, kind of see how your own workflow uh, fits, and uh, you know, and maybe try to customize it. it may not take over a hundred percent of your shell work, but you know, it might uh, ex you know might might uh, be a little better in some aspects. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think there could be some possible there. I, uh, yeah, let's see. make it a little bigger for you. Um, I mean, you can certainly do this sort of thing here where I'm just um, setting the environment path to certain things that I want, and that way I can kind of keep it clean. can't do any input at all. Um, that said, I've been kind of thinking of how I would want to uh, hack that uh, next time um, I kind of run into that issue. Um, like I say, I've been uh, pulling things into buffers and then passing the contents of those buffers into programs, uh, like what I was just showing there with that uh, BRGS thing. So yeah, there, there are certain aspects of e show where you kind of have to re, uh, I don't know, rethink or maybe readjust uh, your workflow. So it may not be a hundred, you know, may not be for everybody. Uh, 
Is is uh irrigation or connection uh interaction with the long running persons in Emacs? Do you have something handy? Boy, uh okay. I uh I don't uh I could kind of imagine just using term to connect directly to that Tmux, whether it's local or over SSH. Uh because I think once you start getting into the um the fancy curses that it's going in e Emacs. I don't think in the E shell is going to be able to handle that sort of thing. Uh, that said, it would be interesting to um, to figure. I don't know. All right, you got me thinking. I um, I don't know just yet, but uh, I could see the potential. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything, but uh, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to have you guys share back. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I have seen that. I didn't know that was what it was uh, trying to do, though. I haven't tried playing with it for a while. Yeah, sounds good.